Okay, let's see if I can close this thing on the side here. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, um, hit my volume here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try and uh, give you an overview of uh, what can be done with Oscar 100. So I'm firstly going to try and take you through uh, what the satellite is and what it can do, and then we'll dive into what kind of ground station you could uh, set up to, to start communicating with it. Um, if I can get next slide. Okay. So uh, we'll do the background. Uh, we'll do dynamic of uh, geostationary orbits. We'll do a narrow band linear transponder, and then we'll do the wide band linear transponder. And that's the DBV S2 stuff, the the the, the video capabilities. Uh, and obviously, we can actually send data through there as well, and then the possible ground station. So, uh, Qatar Satellite Company uh, uh, is their second satellite. Uh, the first one was SL1, and they launched it via SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in 15 November uh, 2018. Uh, the launch was delayed quite a bit, and I think it was uh, probably uh, uh, delays in the manufacturing of the satellite, and obviously then having an opportunity when, when to have the satellite being launched. Uh, the commissioning and uh, took about two months after it was launched. Um, I was actually following it quite nicely. It was moving from West Africa, eventually stabilizing a little bit north of center of mid Africa. Uh, it became operational during February 2019, and uh, and uh, German uh, amateur radio league got uh, managed to secure the privilege to have an amateur radio pilot on this, and I'll show you some more details later on on how they did that and um, uh, the and how it got its name. Uh, it's a circular orbit. Uh, not elliptical, circular, and its orbital period is equal to the Earth, so it rotates with the Earth, so it's geostationary from Earth point of view. So it appears motionless, and uh, its alt altitude is about 35,000 uh, kilometers above Earth, so that's quite a quite a long distance. So uh, the previous high altitude amateur satellite uh, satellites were always uh, elliptical, uh, phase C satellites. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the Oscar 10s, Oscar 13, and Oscar 40. They were all uh, phase uh, C satellites. And uh, it was really nice to have it. If you have the ellipti elliptical path above you, it was really nice. You had a few hours to communicate uh, via the satellite. The footprint was also very nice. When it's on its furthest above you, you probably get similar um, uh, footprint like uh, Oscar 100. So that was a couple of years ago. I mean, I think there was a 10-year dead period uh, where we couldn't really use uh, that type of footprint, which has really opened up the, uh, the geostationary satellite capabilities, has really opened it up for us. And I think America is also now looking at a geostationary as well. And I'll show you the footprint. So. So if you look at it from uh, from a satellite view, uh, that you can see it's almost covering a half half of Earth, which is quite a nice uh, view angle. That um, if you look at uh, from a Google Maps point of view, that's sort of what Google says. And if you look on the left hand side, yeah, you'll see there's a little bit of South America here where my cursor is. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope so. And uh, India is they covered, uh, and then Australia is just missed. That's a pity that's uh, missed, but that's how it is. And then um, if you look at this uh, view, is uh, that's a five degree angle and a 10 degree angle. So you can see there's quite a bit of uh, South America that's covered, uh, not too bad, M mostly Europe and Africa. Uh, it covers a population of about 5.2 uh, billion people nearly 1.5 million uh, radio amateurs, 225 DXCC entities. So you can, uh, there's opportunity for competition here as well. Uh, the footprint extends from east tip of Brazil to the west of Vietnam. Um, that's, I've sort of showed you that. 
does not include USA. Some pe people say it's uh, it's a bad thing. Some people say it's a good thing. Um, make your own choice. So this is sort of the transponder, the narrowband transponder um, band plan. So you need to go up at about 2.4 gigahertz to uh, 2.4 uh, 500 for the narrow band. And this is the band plan, bottom is CW and then digital SSB and mixed modes at the top. It's got three beacons. So originally it didn't only have two beacons and it was narrower. Uh, I think it was 120 kilohertz uh, bandwidth, but it's now 250, which is quite nice. It's opened it up. Um, I realized that um, the, the bandwidth was available on the satellite and they were worried in the beginning. I think that amateurs might misuse it. And I think they've realized that uh, amateurs are reasonably responsible and they've uh, opened it up a bit, which is quite nice. So here's the, the, the two band plans, the narrow band 250 kilos you can see on the left. And then the eight meg bandwidth uh, is the wide band uh, transponder. So, which is quite nice is uh, there's a lot of capability in 8 meg, um, and you can transmit different bandwidth capabilities. There's a band plan for that. Unfortunately, I didn't put it in the slide, but you can do from about uh, 100 kilohertz to, uh, if I'm correct, 1.2 meg bandwidth video transmissions on there. And there's uh, quite a lot of channels available. And I was surprised some days it's quite busy, especially at night. So the actual satellite was uh, was built originally for a TV uh, transmissions in um, the Qatar area, north of Africa. And uh, then the, the satellite itself has got a primary and a secondary transponder. So normally the secondary one would be put on to um, standby mode if the primary one would fail and uh, it would then uh, be switched on the secondary one. So what uh, the AMSAT um, uh, Deutschland has done is they have now uh, enabled the secondary um, transponder for the amateur uh, use. And uh, I think it was modified a little bit, uh, not 100% sure, but to, to operate in amateur band. And that's basically what you can see here. So the primary one is operating and the secondary one is operating. And that, that's why it's very important that we don't misuse the secondary one because it does inf influence the primary one, I think. And therefore, if we do misuse it, um, they will probably disable it. So there's some rules uh, when it comes to uh, satellites, um, especially geostationary ones. Uh, the no strong, uh, you shouldn't transmit uh, your signal stronger than the beacons. So the beacons is really your indication. If you look at your own signal coming down, never be above the beacon. In fact, I would say keep about three dBs below the beacon. It would be probably a safe way. Uh, no FM modes are being used, AM and so on. Wideband modulations is not allowed. It's uh, purely um, SSB and digital modes that's allowed. Uh, no transmissions below the low, lower beacon. So you'll see the lower beacon is a CW beacon on, on the narrow band set, uh, uh, channel. And then we've got uh, uh, no transmission above the upper beacon, which is uh, a telemetry type of beacon. And, uh, and it's, it's a PSK be beacon. The transponder is a bent pipe, so it's linear. Uh, so if you up the, the uh, uplink frequency, the frequency on the down like 10 gigs megahertz will also go up, so which is quite nice. It's difficult to operate an, a nonlinear transponder sometimes because if you go up, it goes down and you have to uh, get your head around that. Uh, they've built a LILA capability that if you overdrive the satellite, uh, it will actually make a a LILA side type sound over your modulation. And obviously it does influence some other people that's actually operating on the satellite because the satellite will then kick in its automatic gain control and everybody gets influenced. So please don't overpower the satellite. Uh, it's full duplex capabilities. So you can listen to yourself and you should have full duplex capabilities when you operate the satellite because you need to look at your own signal. Um, I think once you've got your your um, system working properly and set up and configured, 
it's good to probably use a headphone because sometimes the echo or the feedback that you get from your own signal can influence the way you communicate. You sort of have a delay and so on and so on. So it's it's quite nice to operate it with a headphone and a microphone. Uh, the middle beacon is modulated with a 400 uh, bits uh, BPSK and it's similar to uh, uh, phase three satellites. Now G3RUH is the demodulation modem that you can use to decode it. There's quite interesting information down there. Uh, remote operation over the internet, uh, gateway traffic is undesirable. And the reason for that is that um, they say that if other people are using your station and you cannot monitor it, and they might misuse the satellite and so on and so on. So uh, things like um, uh, using APRS, I suppose, and uh, allowing other people to use your gateways not allowed, or echoing other people to use your gateways probably not allowed if you don't monitor it. So I would reckon if you do set up uh, automatic gateways, then please uh, allow only predefined people to use the system um, and not open it up to the whole world. Uh, the original build was by AMSAT Deutschland. I think I've covered this. Uh, the frequency, downing frequency, vertical polarization is the downing uh, on 10 gigs. So for the narrow band downing frequency, uh, it's vertically, vertically polarized. So if you use an um, LNB, and we'll get to the technical hardware of, of what you need for the satellite, is if you place uh, the LNB vertically and you uh, give it a 13 volt bias, uh, it will then receive the narrow band signal. And if you want a wide band signal, you'll increase the frequency a little bit and you put 18 volts into the LNB and it will switch horizontally. Or if you don't want to switch the, um, the voltage, you can go and to the dish and obviously turn your LNB to a horizontal position. And that's normally the indication where your coaxial cable comes out of the LNB is where uh, your vertical position is. Uh, preferred modes is SSB and CW, I've covered that. What power do you need? You probably need about a five watts um, uplink power in a 120 centimeter dish. Uh, most people are using a, a, a 1.2 meter offset dish um, in South Africa. You can probably get away with a smaller dish but in higher power. But if you look at the cost per watt at those frequencies at 2.4 gig, it's probably cheaper to get a bigger dish than buy a more expensive power amplifier. If you want to be mobile, then maybe a more expensive um, power amplifier is worthwhile because then you can uh, maybe take a 80 centimeter dish on your vehicle, set it up and use a higher power um, amplifier. So Lila will kick in, I've mentioned that. Uh, Ensure fair play, the satellite's not hogged by a few very high power transmissions. Uh, I've noticed um, lately that there is some people that's misusing it, and um, uh, I think if that carries on, they uh, might uh, disable the satellite. And I think um, at least if you can uh, recognize who's actually misusing it, please help us to control uh, the people that's misusing it. So uh, what, what do you need to listen to it? Um, if you just want to uh, start off by having a listening capability, you need a, a Ellis uh, DSTV LNB, um, and then you will put 12 volts there. I've put 12 volts here. You actually need to put 13 volts, depending on your length of your coax. Sometimes uh, 12 volts is not good enough to power up the LNB, and you might not understand why you're not receiving any signal. So I would suggest try and get a 13 volt uh, supply. The IF is at about 739 megahertz. So if you use an SDR receiver, tune to that frequency and um, point the dish to the satellite. <clears throat> and you should see some like little needles coming up uh, at that frequency, and then you know you're on a satellite. Uh, it's uh, the edge of the amateur band. Um, you can use a normal dongle, like I mentioned, um, and you can use a waterfall display to to listen to everybody. So yes, basically a setup. Uh, you've got a 60 centimeter dish for reception. You don't need a bigger dish, like I mentioned, 1.2 meters. 
Ku uh, band LNB bias T. So the bias T is a little power injector that you will push the power up to the LNB, and then you will put your 13 volts in there. And then the other side of the power injector will block the DC and will uh, allow the RF to uh, go out into RTL dongle, or I'll mention some other dongles later on if you want to do the wideband DBV video stuff. Uh, I would recommend the, the better ones, computer, laptop, and so on. That's, that's a simple reception capabilities, uh, and I would call it a digital reception capability. You can obviously use down converters with a normal receiver, um, like a two meter or a semi centimeter if you've got a SSB rig, then you can use a down converter straight to the rig and I'll show you some examples of that as well. Any questions so far? Okay. So, okay, so how do you get your dish up? Um, you basically turn your uh, dish to about minus six degree uh, left of north. And uh, what you then do is the dish at the back has got uh, the angle of elevation and you basically take it to, and enjoy, if you enjoy back about 59 degrees, I would say 60 degrees. And uh, don't use the, the boom in the front to, to, to try and direct the elevation. That is not correct. You must use the elevation angle at the back because the offset dishes, that front uh, angle is not similar to the actual um, receiving angle from the satellite. I think a few people make that mistake. So uh, I would suggest um, rather use the, uh, the angle on elevation thingy at the back of the dish. So what you'll do is you'll take your SDR, take a laptop, go to the dish outside, um, put the laptop next to you so you can actually look at the dish itself, oh, sorry, at the SDR signal yourself, and then uh, turn the dish uh, straight north, a little bit left, a little bit right, up and down, until you see those little needles as uh, I've got in the picture on the left here, and then obviously tune it for the maximum signal. And I think once you've got that, you've got your receiving system up and running, and then uh, start listening. So if you do, if some of these dish, uh, dishes that you get do, do not have the actual elevation angle at the back, you can probably print this out, put it at the back, hang a little wire uh, or, or a little rope with the weight at the bottom and set your angle. So that's another way of doing it. Um, now we can look at uh, simple ways of getting onto the satellite or cheaper ways. Let's say we're going to go progressively from a simple mechanism to get on the air, getting transmission to the satellite. Now you can use um, uh, a mixer like I've got here, showing you a mixer and then a local oscillator. And then you can use a two meter rig or a, a seven centimeter rig or whatever you've got available and then you use an attenuator in line and then you could uh, mix it with your mixer board and uh, a local IDF4351 signal generator with a little Arduino and a little screen that you can plug on it can give you a local oscillator. And then you can use your SSB rig with the attenuator into the mixer and uh, you'll probably need about a 40 dB uh, amplification. Uh, these little amplifier boards, they, although they say 40 dB, they're more closer to 30 dB. A five watt little Wi-Fi uh, amplifier, a low pass filter, and then you need a potty feed, and that's sort of the feed uh, mechanism that you need on the dish. So that that will be a simple way of getting on the air. Uh, you can even uh, just start with CW. Maybe uh, you'll see that at the bottom I've got the Raspberry Pi uh, hat that you can plug onto a Raspberry Pi, and you can do SSB and all kinds of modulations straight from the Raspberry Pi. If you don't have a rig, that's maybe even a cheaper option. Or you can even control the IDF4351 straight from the Raspberry Pi, you don't need the Arduino. So there's different ways. That's if you want to bullet yourself, if you do, do it yourself, uh, uh, ham, this is probably a, a way to get onto the air. And maybe uh, start with digital modes, start with CW. This kind of configuration is probably ideal for, for, for the guys that love uh, digital modes. You then can uh, migrate to uh, other SDR capabilities, and I'll take you uh, through some of those um, options. So uh, 
Uh, if you look at the transverter block, so what I've just shown you is you've got the two meter TX uh, is normally 10 watts. Uh, if, if you use a rig or you're using a, a Raspberry Pi hat, it's like one milliwatt. You use the IDF 4351 PLL with Arduino. You've got your 2.4 gig uh, signal, you amplify it. You need to put a bandpass filter to take the un unwanted signal because of the mixer, you will have the sum and the difference amplifier and back to the dish. So here's a couple of uh, examples of building your own oscillator at, uh, at uh, 2.4 gigs or a little bit lower than that. So you can get these off the shelf little modules. Uh, one, some of them plug into USB port, some of self driven with the Arduino on it and you can configure it uh, manually uh, to drive your um, mixer. So the next step, I would say, if you want to use an SDR, um, uh, you can use HackRF, you can use uh, Pluto, Lime SDR. Now, what is the difference? Which one should I use? Um, now, the HackRF is, I would say, the entry level 8-bit uh, A2D uh, for satellite work. It's probably your cheaper option. It's got a built-in uh, stable oscillator, so you don't need to modify anything you can use it off the shelf. Uh, you probably need a little preamp between that 8 watt amp and hack RF. I forgot to put it in the picture here. Uh, low pass filter, and then you use this um, the potty feed that you can see in the top right hand corner to the dish, and uh, up you go. So you can use a Lime SDR or a Pluto. If you want to go the video route eventually, if you want to go to DBV, maybe the Lime SDR is the way to go because then you can use it for DBV as well. Uh, most of the satellite DBV capabilities, most people are using Lime SDR for that, so that's probably the route to go. If you're purely interested in the narrow band, maybe the Hack RF or the Pluto is probably the, the route to go. Um, that's sort of a, a simple way to get on air at the SDR route. So if you want to do uh, digital modes, you can do the normal digital modes, you can use uh, Whisper is, you can do slow scan TV, APRS. There's a lot of slow scan TV actually on the satellite. Um, especially in the mornings, I've, I've, I've pulled down quite a few pictures from there, which is quite nice. So that's also something that you can do through the satellite, which is fun. Send pictures to each uh, uh, other. And that's using the narrow band. So you don't need to go to the DBV route and with expensive equipment. And you can still share photos and send images and things, which is, uh, which is quite nice. All right, so, uh, so what do we need for power amplifier? So there's a lot of options out there. So depending on what you want to do, if you just want to get on air, you can probably use this 8 watt amp, the Chinese amp, or the 4 watt uh, Chinese amp, the Edup, one on the uh, top left or uh, bottom right. I would say those two, although they've got different ratings, they, they give you about the same output power. You probably get about three to four watts out of it um, with, a, uh, with a 40 dB preamp from a SDR. If you want to do, uh, I would say, DBV, then you should look at the 12 watt amp, the uh, bottom left or the top right hand side. I would suggest if you if you want to do 1.2 meg um, type of DBV video capabilities, you will probably need 30 watts in a 1.2 dish. In fact, I would go for a 2.3 uh, uh, meter dish if you want to really do 1.2 meg. Uh, some of some of these amps you can do small modifications to get one or two dBs extra out of it. Uh, if you look at that 8 watt amp, there's a lot of stuff on the internet uh, where they disable the TX and RX capabilities. You keep it on TX mode, and you actually win uh, one or two dBs on it. Uh, I, I honestly think it's overrated. Some of those mods I've done a few tests myself, and the only real difference that I got is if you take the output. A pin diode, which does a TXRX switch, and modif and put a little short link over it, you get 1.2. The other mods really didn't do much difference that I could find. Okay, so so your setup, uh, your feed. I mean, a lot of people could use uh, the spiral uh, that you see here on the right hand side. Uh, that's probably if you use a 1.2 meter dish or bigger. Uh, a spiral is probably better if you. If you want use 1.2 meter or lower, I would use the potty. Uh, 
um, because of the the circumference of the dish itself, um, you probably get better results with um, the spiral on the three meter dishes. You can even use uh, the grid antenna that's at the bottom. Um, I've, uh, I've successfully communicated via satellite with the grid antenna at the bottom. So if you have a separate dish, you can use the grid uh, as well. I did that to do mobile type of, type of communication. But uh, I think using a single dish just with a more powerful amplifier will save you space and time because you don't need two dishes and so on. Um, this is the 40 dB or as I call it, the 30 dB gain little preamp that you need between the actual power amp and your SDR. You need to, to get about 316 milliwatts into the actual power amp uh, for it to operate properly. And this is ideal for that. Um, the LNB b itself, uh, how does it work? It's got the vertical and horizontal little antennas in, in the feet uh, positioned in two different angles, 90 degrees of each other, and then they've got a little switch. So if you put the 13 volts on it, it switches to the one preamp, and if you put the 18 volts on the DC, uh, it switches to the other one. So um, uh, the frequency uh, jumping capabilities is only being configured if you put, uh, I think it's, I uh, can't remember the tone, I think it's 88 kilohertz tone, then it can even switch the local OSI, but it's not required for Oscar 100 reception. Uh, you can just use the 13 and 18 volt um, uh, DC switching to switch between the polarization. So if you want to uh, listen to the narrow band, you will keep 13 volts. If you want to listen to the, um, the wide band DVB, you will switch to 18 volt. And what you'll notice is that you do get a dual um, Allen B. It's got two ports on it. So you can use the one for 13 volts and one for 18 volts. So you can do your DBV on one SDR, and you can do the narrow band on another SDR, and you can do it simultaneously if you want to. Um, this is the sort of uh, examples of the power injector. So you get this of the shelf type of uh, unit. So it basically has got a little inductor in there that sort of blocks RF to your power supply, and it's got a, a decoupling capacitor that uh, blocks the RF from going to your SDR. Um, this is the LMB. Uh, that's a uh, orientation vertically or horizontally. Uh, you can either turn the LMB if you use a single port LMB, or if you use a dual LMB, you put probably 13 volts in the one and 18 in the other one, and you can you, you do uh, uh, receive both um, signals from a satellite simultaneously. SDRs. Um, you can use the RTL dongle for narrow band, works very well. If you want to do the wide band, you want to see the whole 8 meg bandwidth, then you can use the MSI SDR or SDR Play or one of those. Um, you'll need that to see the whole band. Um, then for transmission, you can use the LIME for DBV, hack RF for uh, SDR, or, or you can probably use it for DBV. I haven't tested that myself. Or you can use the ATLAM Pluto for DBV and narrow band. So that's sort of, I think, the mainstream um, SDRs that's been used for the satellite. I did some quick tests on the different Plutos, um, hack RFs, to, just to look at the purity of signal. Uh, if you look at the Pluto, it's got these little, if you look at those um, uh, markers two and three, it's, it's got these little sideband noises on it. Um, at, this was tested at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, if you look at the SDR Lime, it's also got a little bit of uh, sp spurs at uh, left and right of the carrier. And if you look at the hack RF, it was reasonably clean. So I think if you look at a purity from a signal point of view, I would say the, the hack RF was quite clean. Um, the analog, analog route. Let's say you're not interested in an SDR at all. You want to use your rig. Then you can use the DX Patrol type uh, down converters. Um, they've got a little switch on it that can switch the um, IF frequency to 28 megahertz, 144 megahertz, 430 megahertz, or 1.2 gigs. So with this, you can transmit your three watts uh, out of your rig. If you don't, if you more than that, you can't reduce it. You'll need a little um, RF attenuator into the actual up converter into a power amplifier. 
And you can use the 8 watts and the 5 watts amplifiers as I've showed you, or a 12 watt, depending on how much you uh, size of your dish, into the feed. And then you can use your analog radio for your transmission. You still don't have reception here. So reception is not built in here yet. The DX Patrol has got a receiving capability to do the same thing, and you can use your same rig, same frequency uh, for reception. I'll show you details around that. Here's an example of uh, a transmission. They were using the RF up converter power supply. This was placed at the dish, and they were running uh, RG58 at, uh, uh, I think, 144 megahertz at, uh, I think it was about 10 meters from, from the shack. So that was the configuration, and that works. Uh, that was uh, configured in a 1.2 meter dish, and that was working reasonably well. So here is a, a hybrid configuration. So you would use um, maybe analog for transmission, or uh, and and uh, your SDR for reception. I think this is probably uh, what mo most people would use because it's it's probably. Uh, if they want to use uh, the existing rig, or you can do everything digitally with just one SDR for transmission and reception. I think uh, price-wise, if you look at the cost, uh, the SDR is cheaper. I would say the hybrid is more expensive, and then the pure analog one is the most expensive one. So here is a pure... Um, analog configuration, so where you use the DX Patrol for uh, up conversion and down conversion, and you can use your rig for reception. So it's still, again, it's all, both sides is configurable, 28 megahertz, 144, 430, or 1 1.2 gig. Depending on what uh, receiver or transceiver you've got, you can change the dip switches on the two little modules, and you should be up and running. And uh, I think something that I didn't show here is maybe the power amp. Yeah, I've said 12 watt power amp. You can use an 8 watt or a 4 watt depending on the size of your dish. So here's a, a possible uplink transmission for um, uh, DBV. Um, if you want to do DBV, uh, I would suggest use the line 40 amp preamp for what it's probably not going to get you for DBV, but for uh, narrow band, uh, if the 4 watt is okay. I would suggest uh, replace the 4 watt with 30 watts for DBV, and you can do um, DBV transmission to the satellite. Um, video on line, uh, most people had, uh, had very good success with the line um, configuration, and you can see uh, some examples. So I would suggest if you really want to do DBV, then get line from day one um, and not uh, anything else. If you purely interested in the narrow band, then start with uh, Hack RF uh, as your entry level, or if you want to go the analog route, then DX Patrol. Um, here is a sort of another configuration that you can configure. So uh, um, this is a simple Hack RF transceiver, and this is what I'm using myself. Uh, this is what I configure, and uh, this is what I use every day. I've got a little Raspberry Pi sitting at the dish, and I've uh, Wi-Fi linked it uh, to my house Wi-Fi, and I use Echolink to communicate to it, and I can talk via the satellite via my Echolink on my mobile phone. So that's really a nice capability um, to use. Um, one thing I do must mention at this stage is a lot of these LNBs do drift Frequency-wise, on the dish, from temperature, you know, if the sun shines, it doesn't shine. You communicating to somebody, and suddenly uh, there's a cloud coming across, and your frequency drift down. So there's a lot of software nowadays that uh, will solve the problem, and uh, I'll show you some of the software versions that you can get. There's free software that you can put on Raspberry Pi, and you've got uh, capability to actually uh, it will auto lock to the satellite beacon and it auto adjusts the frequency. So that problem is, uh, is disappearing with the, the digital modes and software of SDR. If you have analog um, capabilities or using the analog route, you will have possibly have to use the external 10 megahertz uh, reference oscillator to make sure that the LNB doesn't drift and that makes it a little bit expensive. Um, this is sort of an example of the SDR software that's uh, free of charge. 
the one you see on the right hand side here you can see my little um, uh, echo link uh, on my mobile phone and that's how I communicate uh, to the satellite so it's a simple setup that you can set up on your Raspberry Pi at the dish you don't need any cables there you just need power at the dish and you off you go and just a little examples how to connect and so on and so on I've got a video here if you guys want to see it we'll see how the time is and I'll show it you uh, towards the end um, here is an example how you can switch your 13 volt and 18 volt with two power supplies and injecting is a different signal injector I'm uh, showing here it's one from Ellis be careful that some of them do actually push the DC to the SDR and you might blow it up so I would really uh, double check uh, the injectors so this is another option Anton you've got five minutes left yep I'll try and to, to quickly uh, software you've got the SDR shop uh, SDR Uno HD SDR GNU radio SDR console this is all receiving capabilities uh, transmitting uh, SDR console has got also a satellite um, beacon tracking so the drift has disappeared and GNU radio has got that built in um, other software is QTC SDR Quest uh, and GQRX for reception uh, I would uh, the stuff that I'm using on my little Raspberry for instance I'm using GNU radio and uh, SDR locking software for reception uh, web SDR narrowband is probably the easiest I uh, just wanted to show you what you can do there if you want to do the wideband uh, you can either go to a web SDR like this uh, to mine you can uh, go and look at the actual uh, wideband signals you can see here on the left hand side on the green the the bandwidth of the actual wideband dbv signals so you can see it says 333 kilo cycles the other one I think looks like 35 kilo cycles and the one on the left is the beacon 1.5 meg so depending on your power capabilities you can probably up the quality of your um, signal by increasing the bandwidth this is a wideband uh, receiving capability so I suggest use a 12 bit 10 megahertz bandwidth as MSI SDR or SDR play for reception um, yes a little I don't know if this video will play um, I'll show you how it actually looks like oops now it's clicking back I'll have to maybe play the videos afterwards but this is how basically the signal would look like on the left hand side if you look at it from with the MSI SDR you'll tune to the frequency and then you can use normal command line utilities to actual decode you'll see this example RX SDR that I've got here you run this command line utility the problem is you have to specify the frequency so what I did in the beginning is I looked at that web SDR look at the center frequency run the command and it starts uh, playing your video um, let me see if I can play the videos at the end Let's see if we can get through everything um, so this is uh, the software for Windows uh, so you can configure it on Windows um, and then once you've uh, got the software running and configured and playing you're using a normal VLC video player to actually play the video back for you so for reception you can you use this little Windows software uh, which is downloadable from this link and then uh, you'll use VLC to locate I'll show you some tips how to configure the Windows version yes basically what you need to configure set the frequency tune it to the middle uh, then set um, the other uh, FFT size and FFT in intense capability so that you see the four dots at the bottom once you've got that then tune your VLC uh, to connect to the actual app, uh, software and you'll see the video being decoded uh, Wideband uh, QDBVs uh, can can be configured. Yes, some tips are uh, for the Windows uh, version of the software: how to tune it, how to configure it. So you can use that uh, to get yourself going. Here is some uh, D, uh, wideband DBV transmitters uh, examples. So you can see the the Lime SDR on the right hand side here, and then you would use that. And there's some Raspberry Pi underneath. On if you look on the left hand side, there's a Raspberry Pi underneath. With LCD and you can get uh, very fancy if you want to these are standard uh, open source software that you can install in it uh, I would reckon you probably can get away with uh, with just using your laptop talking to the Lime SDR and, and running the software on the laptop you don't need to uh, then uh, have the expense of the fancy displays and so on and so on 
here is a, a quick uh, picture of all the uh, different options that you can use for a digital mode. So you can either use a laptop or a SDR or a Raspberry Pi to set up your station for transmission and reception. And here's an example of uh, analog configuration. So you can use all these different options or you can use it as an hybrid where you might use an SDR for reception and analog for transmission or purely analog for transmission or reception. So you can make up your own station by selecting the different options. Um, here is my mobile option. Um, so if you look at the left, that's what I use. I've got a Raspberry Pi, I connect to it from my mobile phone, and I transmit to the satellite. Um, I don't use a big one like you see on the right-hand side. It's uh, it's a 1.2 meter that fits on the back of my bucky, and if I'm in the Bundus, I put it up, and I've got access to data, uh, video, and communication, no problem. I think that's it. Uh, any questions? I'm afraid we will have to um, leave questions to the end because we're late, uh, Anton, for the next presentation. But thanks okay. very much. Yeah, and uh, just give us the the website where all this stuff is available. Yeah, it's www.giga.co.za. G I G A dot C R O Z A. All these modules are available. Um, we've got 95% uh, of the stuff in stock. Uh, and if it uh, if it's not in stock, let me know. Um, we can get it for you. Okay, Anton, thanks very much. It's um, like a lot to to absorb. <clears throat> so if you stick around, then after our next presentation, we have some time for people to ask you questions. I'm sure there there are must be uh, quite a lot. So yeah, thanks very much, and we'll come back to you this now. <clears throat>